I want to be sure we pray for those among us that aren't feeling well. Apparently there are several that are fighting the cold or sinus issues, but some of them are still here tonight, but others are not feeling so well. Keep them in your prayers. Some are playing hooky, yeah. It's not even fishing weather yet. I want to talk tonight out of Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> I can't remember exactly when, last fall sometime, we uh, began to do a walk through the book of Romans. And I wasn't so concerned about preaching out of Romans every week, but I wanted that to be what we went back to in between other things that were going on, whether we had special, our guest speakers, or just felt like the Lord may be leading a specific direction a particular week. But we're going to get back to Romans tonight. Tonight is part 10, and we'll begin in chapter 5 and read verses 1 through 10. So if you want to follow along as best you can, we'll be reading Romans 5, 1 through 10. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now I'm going to read that verse again because that's going to be our emphasis tonight. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, a righteous person. So, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we were reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So as I said tonight, we want to take another step on our walk through the book of Romans, and I want, to, I want to spend our time primarily on verse 2 of chapter 5, and in verse 2, Paul makes two statements in this verse, the first one being, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and the second is, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So in verse 2, Paul is reminding us of something that I think is much more profound and much more weighty, weighty, heavy, than the casual read might indicate. Uh, if we just casually look at these two statements, we might just say amen and move on. But there is a reason why Paul makes this statement, or there is a foundation, if you will, on which these two statements rest. And that's what I want to address tonight. He said that though or through him, talking about the Messiah, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So understanding the depth of this part of verse 2, I think, gives us the reason why we rejoice in the statement of the second part of verse 2. And I want to be clear, I'm not focusing on verse 2. Two, because I think it's the most important verse out of the ones we read tonight. I'm not, that's not why I'm focusing on it. It's not of greater worth than, say, verse 1, which says, Therefore, 
Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace through God, or we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think we here at uh, River City Christian Fellowship have a firm grasp, or we clearly understand that we have been justified by faith. We fully understand that we cannot earn our salvation through works. Amen? Now, I know that there are some, I'm sure, who think otherwise about us, but that's just because they're misinformed. They just don't know the right way to think. But hopefully, they'll come to understand where we're coming from when we are talking about justification by faith. Anyone who has ever experienced justification has done so because of faith. Anyone, ever, in all time, in all biblical history, if they've been justified, it's always been by faith. It's never been by works. In Genesis 15, God is reminding Abraham of his covenant promise, and this is what the Bible says, Genesis 15, verse 5 and 6. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And the Bible says in verse 6, and he believed. And he believed, Abraham believed Yahweh. Abraham believed Adonai. Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. We often look to Abraham as the father of those of faith. And rightly so, because Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, this is what he says, And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So that's why we look to Abraham as the father of those who are of faith. Abraham was counted righteous because he believed. Now, there were others before Abraham who had the same testimony of faith. If you just look in Hebrews chapter 11, you'll read a few of them. In Hebrews chapter 11, take a look at it sometime, you'll see that Abel, Enoch, and Noah were also mentioned as people of faith. They were also mentioned because of their faith. We are justified by faith. So make no mistake about it. We are justified by faith. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I know that I said my focus will be on verse 2, but I feel the need to remind us of something very important. Our faith in God, our being justified before God, was not a decision, it was not an act that originated from the human will. Let me say that again. Our faith in God, or our being justified before God, was not a decision, it was not an act that originated from human will. There is an epidemic. You've heard me talk about this, believe, uh, or you've heard me talk about this in, in times past, but there is an epidemic plaguing Christianity today. It's a serious epidemic, an epidemic that will cause multitudes of people to experience the wrath of God one day. It's an epidemic that will cause multitudes of people to experience the, the wrath of Yahweh at some point in their future. Multitudes of people believe that by a simple prayer that they prayed at the direction of some preacher that they have become justified before God. They believe that they have indeed been born again or saved. Yet, they have not experienced the miracle of being born again. Now Jesus, let me remind us what Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 verse 3. Jesus says, said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, how is it that you can say that this plague is 
affecting Christianity today. I can say that because I know that people who have truly been born again live a life that is pleasing to God. They don't continue on the same path that they were on. They produce fruit in keeping it with righteousness. That's what happens when someone has truly come to faith. Their fruit is in keeping with the righteousness of God. And when we look out among the landscape of today's church and today's Christianity, we are infected by false teachings and false doctrines and multitudes are deceived in, in believing that as long as they've said this prayer, they can live the way they want and it'll all be okay in the end. But I'm here to tell you it's not going to be okay. It's not going to be okay if you've never been born again. John or Jesus told Nicodemus, if you're not born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You're not going to see it. Nicodemus was one of the Pharisees. He was one of the relig uh, religious Jewish leaders. And Jesus said to them all in Matthew 23, verse 15, and in verse 33, he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now listen to this. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Wait a second. Did the Bible say Jesus said that? <laughs> That's what it said. Those words came from the mouth of our rabbi. Those words came from the mouth of the Messiah himself. He says, you are hypocrites. You will travel land and sea to, to win one. And yet, when he becomes a proselyte or when he becomes one of your disciples, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Man, that's a serious accusation. He says, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? There's a question. How are you going to escape it? Think about what Jesus is saying here. You tell me that this same religious spirit is not alive and well in churches all across the world today. Because this is the gospel. This is what it's all about. This is what drives most church organizations. And I want, to, I want you to understand that I am not against missions. But this right here, this spirit right here, is what drives most, most churches to do what they do in the way they raise money and the way they spend money. Give, give, give for the kingdom of God. Give, give, give so the gospel can go out. Give, give, give so we can fly across the world. And if we just win one, it will be worth it. Hello? What's Jesus dealing with right here? He's dealing with something that's very serious. The same spirit is alive and well in the church today. And because the church is spreading a false gospel, because the epidemic of false conversions is so plaguing our church, churches today, there are multitudes and multitudes that have become twice the child of hell than those who proselyted them. I know this is heavy, but I believe it to be the truth. It's a sad truth, but a truth nevertheless. This is not a marginal topic Eternity hangs in the balance when we are talking about being born again. Eternity hangs in the balance when we are talking about justified, being justified before God. Eternity hangs in the balance when we are talking about the miracle of new birth. It's not something to be taken casually or lightly unless one is born again. According to the very words of Jesus the Messiah, you will not see the kingdom of God. There is a miraculous transaction that takes place in a person's life who has been born again. And this topic can be unsettling. We, when we talk about scripturally being born again, it can be unsettling for many churchgoers. Jesus' teaching right here confronts, confronts us, or Jesus' teaching about the new birth confronts us with our hopeless spiritual condition. It causes us to realize that we are dead. The Scripture says that 
outside of faith, we are morally and spiritually dead. Amen? That's, what, that's, 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 what, that's the condition before we are regenerated by the grace of God. Before the new birth happens to us, we are spiritually dead. And we've talked about this before. How in the world do spiritually dead people cry out for help? Spiritually dead people cannot cry out for help. We are in no position to cry out for help. That's why the first two, verse, the first two words of our verse tonight that we're looking, looking at, what does it say? Through Him. Through Him, we have obtained faith, right? It's through the working of God. When Jesus tells us that we must be born again, He's telling us that our present condition is hopelessly unresponsive, it's corrupt, and we are guilty before God. And apart from His amazing grace in our lives, we will die that way physically die that way. We don't like to hear that about ourselves. We don't like to hear that that is our spiritual condition before we are born again. So it's a little unsettling to talk about biblically what we are like biblically before we, before we come to faith. The new birth is unsettling also because it refers to something that is done to us. It is not something that we do. Being born again is something that is done to us. It is not something that we do. John 1.13 emphasizes this. It refers to the children of God as those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. Peter stresses the same thing in 1 Peter 1, 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. He caused it. That's why I say being born again or coming to faith or the desire to come to faith is not something that originates from our human will. It's something that originates by the hand and by the will of God. Amen? Amen. And we're talking about having hope in the glory of God tonight. We do not cause the new birth. God causes the new birth. Any good thing that we do is a result of the new birth, not a cause of the new birth. This means that the new birth is taken out of our hands. It's not in our control. Just like the wind is not in our control. John says the same thing, that being born again is like the wind. We don't know from where it comes, and we don't know to where it is going, but we know that the wind has been here when the wind shows up. That's what John likens to being born again. He says, you don't know when or how. You just know that it's real because you feel its effects. Jesus' teaching about the new birth is unsettling because it confronts us with the absolute freedom of God. Apart from God, we are spiritually dead in our, selfish, in our selfishness and our rebellion. Paul says that we are by nature children of wrath. That's what he says in Ephesians 2 verse 3. Our rebellion is so deep that, that we cannot detect or desire the glory of Christ and the gospel. That's what Paul te- told the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. So, if we're going to be born again, it will rely decisively and ultimately on God. His decision to make us alive will not be a response to what we as spiritually dead people do, but what we do will be a response to Him making us alive. Amen? That's the way it works. This is the basis for the statement that Paul makes in verse 2. He says, Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. That's why Paul told the church at 
the, he told the, the Philippian Christians, he says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. It's God who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So we're dealing with a very weighty statement here in verse 2. And I said in the very beginning of our walk through the book of Romans that we will see and discover truths that I believe will be offensive to many churchgoers. When we read and consider the writings of Paul in the context in which he has written them and take them to heart, we will inoculate ourselves against many of the false doctrines that prevail and hold sway over so many people who believe themselves to be born again. Yet they have never experienced the miracle of new birth. I believe when Paul is writing about this grace in which we stand, he is referencing the new covenant. I believe that he is directly referencing the new covenant. He says, this grace in which we stand. Through him we have obtained faith. And then grace in which we stand. We have taught here at River City Christian Fellowship that grace is not merely unmerited favor. We teach that grace is the divine. It is the supernatural working of the Spirit of God on the heart of of mankind. That's what grace is about. That's what grace is. It is the divine and the supernatural working of God's spirit on your heart. When one truly experiences the miracle of new birth, there is a spiritual transaction that takes place. Amen. Amen. This transaction is described in detail in the writings of Jeremiah and and Ezekiel. So for the sake of time, I just want to reference Ezekiel And what he says was promised in the new covenant. See, that's one of the difficult things out there. That's one of the things that I'm very concerned about. There are so many believers out there, so many churchgoers out there in the church world today who believe, who claim, who say they are saved by the new covenant or they are new covenant believers, yet they don't have any idea what the new covenant is. They can't even turn in, your, into, in their Bible and show you where the new covenant is written about. And for some, they may be smart enough to turn over to the book of Hebrews and, and say, this is where it talks about the new covenant. But the reason we call it a new covenant is because that's what Jeremiah called it. Jeremiah called it a new covenant. But we're going to read Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 24 and 25, and I'm not going to read all the scriptures relating to the, the new covenant that I normally do, but I want, to, I, I want to emphasize what the new covenant does or what God is doing by the work of the Spirit in the new covenant. I want to talk about what it means to be standing in this grace. So Ezekiel 36, verse 24 and 25, he says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. He's talking to Israel and he's talking to Judah. And even over in in the book of Hebrews, when he's talking about the new covenant, he's saying that this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah in that day, saith the Lord. Now, those of us Gentiles who have come to faith, that that should get our attention, shouldn't it? When we see in the Scripture that the new covenant is given to the house of Judah and the house of Israel. It's given to the elect of God. It's given to Israel. Shouldn't that say, what is that all about? Israel, Judah. If you, if you are a Gentile who has truly been born again, there has been a spiritual transaction that has taken place and it has done much more to you than you realize. It has made you a part of the family of God. It has, it has literally grafted you into the vine of Israel. Made you a part of the household of Israel. Many churchgoers don't realize that, that. That's what the new covenant has done. So he says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water 
on you, and you shall be clean from your uncleannesses, and from your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Hello. (laughs) That is the new covenant. That is describing the spiritual transaction that takes place in the heart of one who has come to faith. This is the spiritual transaction that takes place in the heart of one who has been born again. And in the terms that I grew up in, this is the spiritual transaction of those that has taken place in the heart of those who have been saved. This is describing it in detail. Ezekiel is describing a spiritual transaction that takes place when one comes to faith. He is describing the work of God's grace, the work of God's grace, the grace in which we stand when we are truly born again. When God speaks through Ezekiel and says, I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. God himself, Yahweh himself, is describing the working of his grace in which we stand. Amen? All of this is the context in which Paul is writing when he says, through him we have also obtained access by faith into grace, and to this grace, in which we stand. This is the foundation of of why Paul makes that statement, because he clearly understands this to be true. Now, the second part of that verse says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, that's a curious phrasing, I think. We, we rejoice in hope of God's glory. Well, how do we rejoice in that? What is this glory in which we are to rejoice? I hope to help you understand this more in, in, in the time that we have left, because I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it tonight. I may come back to it, but... Paul is saying here in the second part of this verse that we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. How are we to understand the glory of God in this passage? What is the glory of God? It is apparently something that we rejoice about. And that gives us a clue, perhaps, that, is, that it is actually something tangible or something that we can grasp or understand. The glory of God is not some blue haze filling a room somewhere at some time in a conference. It's not a goose pimple that's caused when someone sings a particular song and you do a flag march. That's not the glory of God. The glory of God is something that we can clearly understand and comprehend. But what is it? I believe that the glory of God is something that can definitely be articulated. It's not a feeling. It's an experience. The glory of God is something that happens to us. Amen? Let me remind you of something that I believe with all my heart. From the beginning of time to the end of time, the purpose of God in all that He does, the driving impulse of God's heart is to be praised for His glory. I firmly believe that. That is the basis from which I speak and teach. Everything that God is doing in this earth is for the praise of His glory. From creation to end to the end of all prophecy, His ultimate allegiance. Now, I want you to hear this. 
from creation to the end of all prophecy, God's ultimate allegiance is to himself. His unwavering purpose in all that he does is to exalt the honor of his name and to be marveled at it or to be marveled at for his grace and his power. God said himself through the prophet Isaiah, he says, for my own sake, for my own sake, I act. That could be a little disturbing for some. There may be some hearing that right now saying, well, that's not the God I serve. It may not be. But everything that God does, He does for His own glory. He said through Isaiah, for my own sake, for my own sake I act, says the Lord, my glory I will not give to another. We can have hope in the glory of God. We can rejoice in hope of the glory of God because of this truth. God is first and foremost for himself. And because of this truth, he is first and foremost for his elect. God being for himself is the same as God being... For his elect. I want to repeat that again. God is first and foremost for himself, and because of this truth, he is first and foremost for his elect, the ones who we are to be, the ones who are called, the ones who exist for the praise of his glory. That's his elect. Let me give you a few references that I base this truth upon. We can read through the prophet Isaiah. We can read just in one case in Isaiah 46 verse or in Isaiah 43, verse 6 and 7, and we can answer the question as to why God created us. And this is what he says to Israel. Through Isaiah, he said, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, says the Lord, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. That's what he said. Bring all of them. Bring all my sons and daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who I have created for my glory. Why did God rescue Israel from the bondage of Egypt? David says in Psalm 106, verse 7 and 8, he says, Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider thy wonderful works, but rebelled against the Most High at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake that he might make known his mighty power. Why did God spare them again and again in the wilderness? Ezekiel tells us in chapter 20, verse 14, he says, I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations in whose sight I had brought them out. Why didn't God get rid of Israel? Why didn't God cast away his people when they rejected him as king and wanted someone like Saul to be king over them so that they could be like everybody else? (laughs) Why did God not wholeheartedly reject them at that point? The people literally said, we don't want you to be our king. We want a king like all the other nations. Why didn't God reject them at that point? 1 Samuel 12, verses 20 through 22, he says, the the prophet Samuel speaking here, and he says, Fear not, you have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord. For the Lord will not cast away his people for his great name's sake. You understand why I say that God is first and foremost for himself? Because this is what the Bible says. Everything that he is doing in this earth, he does it in such a way that he is magnified. He does it in such a way that his glory is seen through his people. And then finally in Ezekiel 36, verse 22 and 23, and then in verse 32, Ezekiel puts it like this, and this is some of the detail of the new covenant that I did not read earlier. 
He says, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. And he says, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name and the nations will know that I am the Lord. It is not for your sake that I will act, says the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. He told them, I'm not acting for your benefit. I'm acting for my sake. Now, we benefit from him acting in such a way. That's how I know. That's what I mean by when, when God is first and foremost for himself, he is first and foremost for us, his elect. He will not let his glory fall. He will not let his glory fail. And he has chosen to display the glory of his worth through his people Israel. That was the whole purpose behind the new covenant. He said, I'm going to change their heart of stone, and in its place I will put a heart of flesh, and in them I will put a new spirit, and I will cause them to walk in obedience. I will. It's, you hear that word? I will. God's saying, I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. It's left up to him and not us. We can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because all that God does is for his glory. And we are chosen vessels through which his glory is to be seen in this earth. That is the basis for our rejoicing. That's why Paul says we rejoice in hope of the glory of God because he clearly understood that the glory of God was meant to put on display through his people, through the elect, through Israel. Amen? So that's why he says we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because this is the glory of God. Moses says, I want to see your glory. I want to see you. I want to show me your glory. Let me see you. And God, and I'm paraphrasing this, but God told him, this is my glory. You want to, you want to know my name? You want to see my glory? God says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Amen. And I will have mercy on whom I choose to have mercy. That is my glory. Wow. Now, we can rejoice in that. We can rejoice in that because we know that if we have come to faith, that if we've been justified by faith, if we've been born again, that He will not fail at displaying His glory in our life in some way, in some measure, in some form or fashion, God will be glorified in your life. Amen. <laughs> Smile time. That is good. That is a good thing. That is why we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is the basis of unconditional election. This is the basis for the promise that Paul was using to, the, to encourage the saints in Philippians 1.6 when he says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's what he said. Paul said, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm positive. <laughs> I know this to be true, that he who began a good work in you will complete it right up to the day of Jesus Christ. And then we read in Hebrews, I believe, chapter 3, I believe what's going on there, Jesus is making a statement to the assembly in heaven, I believe this is what the eighth day is all about. There's an eighth day coming in our future. And Jesus is going to stand before the assembly in heaven and he's going to speak to God. He says, and the Bible says that the one who was made righteous are going to present those who were made righteous. And he's going to say, here am I and the people you have given me. I'm telling you what going to be an exciting time. 
This is the emphasis that I wanted to put on Romans 5, verse 2. I hope you see this. Again, he says, Through him we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That verse sits on the foundation that I just laid out before you. I didn't lay it out in great super detail, but it is the foundation on which this verse is sitting. Amen? God bless you tonight. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for your word. We are so grateful for your spirit. We're grateful, Lord God, that you've called us to faith. We're thankful, God, that you have justified us before you. We thank you, God, that you have caused us to be born again and that your love has been shed in our hearts or put in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray, God, that we will learn how to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, that we would understand the basis from which this rejoicing is to come. We would understand why we rejoice. Let our rejoicing come from understanding. Let it come from understanding in this truth that we have shared tonight. And we give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.